Back in my day, there was this thing called the Rubik's Cube. It was a puzzle that you twisted and turned to get all the colors to one side and to make a beautiful pattern where all the colors aligned. And it seemed like no matter how you twisted or turned, it would just lead to utter frustration and seemed impossible to solve. It seemed like almost that you needed to be a magician and have a magic trick to do it. However, what you discovered was that there was a pattern, that there was a system into doing it. And once you learned that pattern and system, it would take you mere seconds to solve. And you would never have to use anything else to do it. It could be jumbled as much as possible and still if you use the system you'll solve it. In writing there's something similar called the three-act structure. The three-act structure is a system that's designed to help you tell your story. Most stories, if not all, have a three-act structure. It's the how you get to the three-act structure that's the interesting part in writing. Because not everybody does it the same. There are many methods that you can use to get to the three-act structure. And that is what this show is about, as we take a look at how you develop your own three-act structure that works for you. My name is Madeline Holly Rosing. I am the writer creator of the steampunk supernatural prose and graphic novel series Boston Metaphysical Society. Uh, I am Megan Morgan. I'm the author of The Altered Wake and also I have uh, several short stories in uh, In the Blink of an Eye, a uh, anthology book that is based off of the movie uh, Butterfly Kisses by Eric oh. Christopher Myers over here. <laughs> Yes, and I'm Eric Christopher Myers. I'm an independent filmmaker, and I am the writer-director of Butterfly Kisses, and also, it's probably pretty shiny, It Voted, so make it sure you, uh, you voted okay. as well. And uh, also, the independent film Roulette, both of these are on Amazon Prime. Check them out. And I also write film criticism for Ain't It Cool News, typically on the subjects of genre theory and franchise history. Hi, I'm Nikki Nelson-Hicks, and I write a whole bunch of different genres. I write science fiction, I wrote a little steampunk story. I write a lot of noir, pulp, adventure stuff. Um, you can follow my stuff on Amazon. Right now, the biggest thing I've got going is the Jake Shinheji series, which is a pulp noir 1930s with a lot of, you know, ghosts and witches and golems and monsters. It's great fun. My name is Robert Cano. I am the author of the Soul of Sorrow series of dark fantasy. Um, I am also going to be publishing my first science fiction novel here very soon, come February. And then because I didn't have enough major projects going on, I decided to start a new one, which is uh, based on Arthurian lore. First, I want to talk about why you want to have a beta reader. What is it that they do for you that you find super important? We can be kind of like tunnel vision-y when we're writing and we make very specific decisions sometimes to get to very specific points. And a beta reader is going to ask questions that you didn't think of. That's really super critical. A beta reader is also going to be one of the first person to raise the red flag over a character who is not behaving the way that they, you know, should be behaving. Uh, so yeah, beta readers, that's a huge thing with them is I don't consider a beta reader someone I want for like a line by line analysis so much as someone who's gonna go, hey, this doesn't make sense. And hey, I don't like that plot point. And oh, what if these two characters got together? That That's the kind of thing that I'm looking for from a beta reader typically. Oh yeah, I agree. I uh, like to use a combination of writers and readers, as beta readers. Uh, I, I love a good beta reader that can read a story and being able to get and see the whole picture and tell me if something just isn't working. And that to me is what a beta reader is. They tell me, is the story working? Is it entertaining? Are you engrossed in it? And what doesn't work? I have one beta reader who's quite anal. And what she'll do is she'll make a list of words that I've used and how many times I've used them. And that was helpful, but man, it must take a lot of her time. But uh, other than that, it's really good for me. It's just having someone to see it from the outside after I think I'm done with it and I'm still always amazed they can find the typos and they can find the grammatical errors or they can find hey you know you changed that character's name like halfway through the book mm -hmm. that's happened 
uh, once or twice. Things like that. That's what they're great for. They're just really good to be like your your Han Solo to keep you not from getting so cocky. Yeah, I I would agree with everybody. I mean, we can't really create in a vacuum. And the questions that beta readers bring to the table, just uh, they find any kind of logic flaws, uh, any character inconsistencies. Um, I mean, you're good beta readers. I mean, we're all obviously we're all talking about people who care about our work and, you know, want it to be better. I think beta readers are, are critical. I relied very heavily on beta readers for my first uh, the novella. Um, after that, my editor is the one that catches most of the big things. So I don't rely on the beta readers as much for that, but I do still send it out to them looking specifically for various, you know, uh, for me, it's mostly inconsistencies. I, I want, because of the way I write, I'm very meticulous about certain aspects. So when it comes down to the things that I'm not as comfortable with, you know, those are the things that I, I will make a list and, and I'll be like, okay, I need you guys to check for this and this and this and this. And I usually have very specific elements. It's just worked right. Right. Um, or as with the shadow cult, what I did is I, I asked my beta readers to look specifically for areas where I could slow it down a little bit because it's a really, really fast paced book, uh, especially when compared against the dark archer. And so, the Dark Archer was very introspective. It was very quiet and, and it was a bit slower uh, just in the way it was presented. Um, pacing was fine and everything, but it was just very meticulous. And then with the Shadow Cult, it was all go no quit for 140,000 words. And so I was looking for specific areas where, one, is it needed? And two, if it is needed that we slow it down, where can I slow it down? I think it's the height of arrogance to think that um, anything that you create is going to come out working for everybody. Sometimes it comes out and it's not working for anybody. Uh, it's very, very, very important to listen to your audience. And I think to be sort of to, to choose not simply people whose opinions you respect, but people whose opinions you don't respect. You have to remember that whatever medium you're working in, your work is going to be watched or read or listened to by hopefully a wide variety of people who are all coming with uh, different sensibilities and who are looking for different things. Art is interactive and it is also collaborative. Even if you're a writer and you think that you're sitting in front of a computer and you're writing the story and you are the sole author of that work, your audience is going to interact and respond to it. And that is largely going to inform where you go next, if it's serialized work or even if you're writing a series of standalone uh, sort of pieces. What people think of your work is largely going to uh, provide a compass if you're intelligent about it and you're listening to what people think. I, as a filmmaker, um, not strictly simply a writer, I sort of produce work that has to be in, you know, from my perspective, peer reviewed on numerous levels, first as a screenplay and then as a first uh, assembly of the footage and then as a finished, polished work. And it is vital to have as much feedback as you can possibly get and to hear all the terrible things you don't want to hear as soon as you possibly can. Well, let me start with you on uh, the next question then, which is, you know, how do you choose your beta readers? What, 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 what are you looking for when you choose them? And, and how many do you think you need? And how many do you usually end up with? I'm... When doing a screenplay, I'm typically looking for other screenwriters to read that work and to give feedback, largely because screenplays don't read, and Joe, you know this as well as I do, they don't read the way that um, you know narrative fiction reads. It's a very specific style that is used to tell that story. It's It's in a lot of ways, telling you as little as humanly possible. And 
non screenwriters or you know sort of non film enthusiasts don't really understand that and perhaps can't process what they're supposed to be doing which is you know you're supposed to be sort of seeing the movie in your head so screenwriters is, that's where i will typically go for that first draft and i would say i have sort of a similar attitude when i do the first cut of a film because often there is no temp sound there is no temp score um you know the sound levels are way off the the color has not been done you'll have missing special effects and i will never forget when i made my first film uh when i did roulette and i put together the very first assembly i tried to show it to someone whose opinion i greatly respected but i had not taken into account the fact that she was not used to looking at unfinished films mm -hmm. she couldn't you know piece it together in her brain and sort of extrapolate what it was going to look and sound like simply because she'd never been exposed to that before and it went over you know like a like a lead balloon it she didn't she wasn't able to see it and whether it's a good film or not once she saw the finished film you know with all the bells and whistles it was there and she was able to process that um and so i've become very very selective then you know sort of focusing on filmmakers for the first assembly then when the movie is done, it's important to let as many people, Joe Walmart included, check it out, tell you what you've got. If we have time and you have interest, I've gone through the process of test screenings and it is a nightmare um, <laughs> because you are asking people to tell you what is wrong, not what is right. And they never hold back. <laughs> oh, when, when someone is being asked to tell you, um, what is not working here? Or how do we make this shorter? Or what characters do you not like? And they have comment cards and focus groups. Um, people want to tell you what sucks about your work, especially if they don't know you're in the room because you shaved your beard and you're wearing a hat and hiding in the back of the room. Um, you will go to a scotch bar that night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Eric uh, brought up something uh, that I want to throw out there too, and that is, are you when you're writing in a specific genre or a specific type of story, you're looking? Are you looking for like-minded people, or are you looking for people who are not familiar with uh, that genre to kind of get an overall perspective? What is the approach overall to, you know, again? finding the right beta readers for yourself and how and how do you do that is it you stay in genre when you do that or is it more you know uh i'm gonna try and broaden it out see see what i get i stay in genre um just because steampunk alternate history is is so niche and i also stay within the medium i if i'm doing a graphic novel i don't hand a graphic novel you know a screenwriter could probably deal with giving a critique on a graphic novel, but someone who's not used to reading a comic script would not be able to process it. Like, you know, Eric was mentioning, because it is very similar to a, a screenplay script. Uh, for my prose, that goes to prose people uh, because I know they can, they can process it. Uh, I actually have one beta reader who uh, can do both because he actually does both. And he's he's a fan of the work uh, and he gives me incredible insight. And I just know when he starts asking too many questions, I, I know I have a problem and I need to, to go back and revisit the story and, and see what needs to be done. Yeah, my other prose beta reader is uh, an editor on the side. Mm -hmm. So that's that's very helpful. But I always ask some my beta readers, I'm looking for broad strokes and... Uh, for bigger issues, and then I let my other editor deal with uh, with other stuff. I'm one of the founding uh, founders of the Nashville Writers Group, and I did a lot of different groups. I did the uh, speculative fiction group, the horror group, the mystery group, and one of the groups I also ran was just the fiction group. And fiction was all of them. So it was all the genres put together, so it was really quite interesting to see people who were writing horror, science fiction, and writing straight you know, literature, get together and have to basically critique each other's work. And it was interesting. However, for my own work, um, I, I try to stay in genre because some people just don't get it. They're not going to get steampunk. They're not going to get horror. 
especially horror. People don't want, they don't want it to be too grisly. They don't want to be too scary or whatever. I'm always amazed by that. You know what you're getting, but they get really upset when horror is horrific. Well, of course. Mm -hmm. But also I've been very lucky because of my interactions with the National Writers Group. I have a little, I had a pool to pick from. And I have my favorites of my favorite writers who I understand will get different, who do different genres. I can use them, but I also have a lot of readers who read my stuff who, who I can I can trust. They can read my work because they've read the different, like the Jake stories. They've read the different Jake stories and they'll let me know when I've gotten off track on a different character. Like so-and-so would never do that. Mama Effie would never do that. Jake would never do that. So I, I tend to do, uh, I mix it up. I relish that. I think that anybody who is a creator, regardless of what genre you are knowledgeable in and, and experienced with, I think that we are all hopefully, if we're coming to the table as peers and saying that we're utilizing the same processes to tell different kinds of stories, I think that for the reader, it should be an interesting sort of experiment to try to get into that headspace. In theory, you do want people who perhaps are not, ex you know, have not experienced much in the way of steampunk to maybe discover it through your work. Um, you do want that crossover sort of appeal because you take Star Trek and you nudge Star Trek a little bit to the left and you get Star Wars. And it's a totally different thing. Space fantasy is a totally different genre. I welcome the feedback from very unlikely sources. I will add, though, to that, that at, at times it depends on how the people are approaching uh, what it is that they're reading. I was for a while part of an, an online critique group where there were a lot of people from a lot of different genres sort of just going around and critiquing other people's stuff. And I received a lot of advice that made absolutely no sense for what I was trying to write. So I very distinctly remember on one particular occasion, uh, there was a gentleman who read the first couple of chapters of The Altered Wake, which is like a sci-fi fantasy. He read it and he told me that I needed to like add more description. And then he recommended that I go read George R. R. Martin. And I was like, <laughs> I don't think that you understand what it is that I'm doing yeah. here. This is supposed to be tight and lean and fast and, like, it's just, I was getting a lot of really bad advice from people who weren't approaching my work as what it was. They were trying to turn it into something else because that was sort of their genre. But they're the same people who are going to write Amazon reviews. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, that's your audience. Whether right. you, you, you like them or not, you're still going to have to sort of listen to what the dumbest person on the street is going to think of your work. Well, sure. And if you're asking me to provide you with something more like George R.R. R. Martin, then I would say that you're probably not actually my audience because I'm not George R.R. R. Martin and I have no intentions of being him. <laughs> your book is 100% less rapey. Yes, 100% less rapey. <laughs> Good. Good. We need less rape. <laughs> yes. So, so it's a difficult position, obviously, you know, yeah, we have our, um, our genre that we write in, we have a very specific focus, we have a very specific audience in mind when we're writing that. And with that is inevitably going to come some form of blowback uh, in terms of reviews and stuff like that for people from people who just don't understand what it is we're trying to do. That's inevitable. Uh, and I, I think it would be unwise for any author who's even just getting started to to the biggest veteran to ever think that they're going to have this kind of mass appeal right not even jk rowling for all of her mass appeal was really mass appeal there's still a large swath of people who never read it didn't like it or anything in between those two and that's okay right um and i'm sure a lot of those people left reviews too so, so it's kind of a tricky situation, I think, from the authorial side. I, I heard mention of like horror, right? There are a lot of readers who are not going to read horror, just period. There are a lot of readers who don't understand fantasy. There are readers who uh, refuse to read YA. I'll raise my hand for that one. And so it's really difficult, I think, to have like kind of a, a catch-all 
And so if somebody is interested in reading, uh, say, my book, and I give them the 411 and I tell them this is what to expect, this is when to expect it, why, uh, and all that and all that jazz, and they still want to read it, then it's on. It's in their court at that point. But if they tell me, yeah, that doesn't really sound like my thing, then I'm not going to send it to them. There, there's literally no point in doing that because whatever feedback they would give me, if at all, it, it'd kind of be wasted. And and that's not what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for wasted time with any of that. And so I think it's really difficult, right? Like I, I stopped beta reading because I can't turn off my editor brain. And right. so... And so that's one of those things where, where I don't offer beta reading for anybody, uh, unless it's somebody very special to me. Um, but even at that, you know, I'm very picky about when I do it or, or what have you. And they, they usually will know they'll end up with a thousand notes, uh, over the course of their, of their uh, manuscript. And so, you know, that's just because I can't turn that part off. Mm-hmm. And, um, but, but as far as like for me sending to others, you know, I want readers, um, specifically. And then sometimes I'll get authors, sometimes I'll get, uh, you know, editors, cause I have quite a few of all of these in my circle now, which is really nice. So I have this really awesome pool, uh, from which to pull from and say, Hey, um, I need some feedback. You know, I, I need you guys to take a look at this for me. And tell me without any, don't pull any punches with me. Tell me what you think. And, uh, and they do. And I appreciate that so much. Do you, do you look to branch out and do you look at, because of what you're writing to branch out? Do you, if you're changing, if you're changing a genre or something like that, do you look at, you know, I really like that person's writing or what they've said about, this genre and I'm going to approach them. Have you ever approached anybody to beta read that I have. haven't, haven't asked you? Yeah, I, I have, I've, I've actually asked. And, uh, one of them was, was actually more of an alpha read. It was before the book was finished. I was having issues with a couple of chapters and I wasn't sure if they were working properly. It was in the dark archer. So it was my first full length novel. I'm sitting there. And I wrote these two chapters and I'm stuck. I'm literally just sitting there and I'm stuck. I don't know what to do or how I'm going to do it or anything else. And I'm, I'm, I'm just confused, right? Like I'm sitting at the screen and I'm just staring and no word, no more words are coming out until I fix this problem or figure out what, a, what it is I need to do. And so I sent, uh, I, I asked for a couple of people to read these two chapters. No other. T- context no story background no nothing just read these two chapters give me your honest feedback be as brutal as you can and then you know i'll I'll know how to move forward from there and so that worked tremendously there wasn't a whole lot i had to change but there was some really really good feedback to help give it a better punch outside of that though as far as the beta reads i really I do look for people who, who I don't know. And then I have the people that, ha, that know my story because that's important to me. Uh, and it's a series. So, you know, if you've read The Dark Archer, then yeah, I'm going to want you to read The Shadow Cult. But if you haven't read The Dark Archer and I send you The Shadow Cult, odds are you're going to be completely lost, but you might pick up on some things that I might have missed otherwise. So there's this you know, balancing act that I kind of have to play with. I have several friends who have known me for a long time who read, you know, my work. And then I'm always trying to bring more people in and especially depending on the book and like what the topic is. uh, I I think that you're always looking to sort of get new voices and fresh eyes on your work because after a while, like, yeah, you have certain people who, you know, you can rely on to do like a good read and to really give critical feedback. Um, those are people who you keep going back to. But also eventually, like if you're doing your job well, um, then they become fans of yours and sometimes they're less likely to catch stuff. So I think it's really important to keep expanding your your circle. Uh, but you also have to be careful in your selections because you do want to make sure that, you know, people who are beta reading are going to be giving you good, solid advice. 
because it's really easy for people to be very critical and just give like bad advice in their criticism. Uh, but there are some people who they can be critical in a way that's constructive. So. Or, or you end up with the other side, which is that, you know, for me, the most worthless advice in the world is it was great. Ugh. Well, what, what would you what would you change about it? Nothing. It's perfect. That's worthless. It's utterly it's it's mm -hmm. I, it's a complete and total waste of time for somebody to tell you how great your stuff was. For me, I thrive on constructive criticism. And I think that, you know, you're talking about the same people might become fans of yours, but I think it goes another step. And that is that um, when you are utilizing the same uh, individuals for peer review, um, they're going to, whether they intend to or not, they're going to become familiar enough with your work that they begin making assumptions about the sort of things that you create. Oh, he's doing this because he did that last time. And, you know, they start to get this feel for what you do and they begin filling in blanks that you don't want them to fill in. You want people to tell you where those blanks are. So I think that it is much more useful to try to find as many new individuals who, even better yet, if they have never read or watched something that you've done before and get their feedback. If you're going to have someone outside your genre read your work, you need to choose them very carefully. They have to be someone who's willing to be open enough to read something that is not in their bailiwick, is not something they would normally read, and give you constructive criticism. I've been part of some review groups in the past and with a lot of different genres, I'm not a big romance fan. And so a lot of times I'll be a romance, but I will look at it in the context of like, okay, how is the character developed? Is the character developed well? Do I believe in this romance that these people could be together? Is the conflict organic? And I am able to leave the fact that I don't care for romances to the side. But not everyone is going to be able to do that. So you need to choose carefully if you're going to be looking for someone outside your genre. I have one question for Nikki, especially because you've written Sherlock Holmes books before. So there's an audience for that, a uh, built-in audience. You have your own unique voice. So how do you tackle something like that with beta readers? Is Do you go after the ones that you know are classic Sherlock Holmes fans, or do you try to capture the people who, you know, maybe on the fringe about it. Well, it depends on what kind of Sherlock Holmes story you're writing. The one I wrote was, you know, canon, had to be. So my beta readers were primarily Holmesians. You've got Sherlockians, those are the people who follow the Benedict Cumberbatch and all that kind of stuff. And you've got Holmesians, and Holmesians are the ones who are pure Conan Doyle. And I got a couple of Holmesians, because that's what I was going for. Also, my editor was brilliant. He was, he's an Englishman. And in Holmesian, he lived near the place that I had set the story, and he was great. Because he's this guy, he would flat out tell me, Nicole, this this chapter doesn't work. It doesn't, it, but it's funny, it's funny. Um, it's not, it doesn't work. Toss it out. Mm -hmm. So he was great, because he, he pulled no punches. He let me know when things did not, were not Sherlock. Because you've got the Sherlockians, who think that Sherlock Holmes ended in the beginning with uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, and the whole John Lockers, and that's a whole whacked out scene and then you've got the Holmesians who are pretty much the Jeremy Bretts and all of those people and I'm more of a Holmesian than a, a Sherlockian. It's a really weird genre to get into because these people ha are just manic about this. I went to a Sherlock Holmes convention. I almost got beat up because they were having a big big argument about where he went to school and I'm like, guys, you, you know he's not real, right? You know this is just a character <laughs> yeah. and they're all just no! Dude, dude, he's not real. Here's the question though that I have. Do you think that it might be easier in music and in movies to get people who aren't interested in your genre to commit to watching it? Yes, because, because you're talking about an hour and a yeah, half versus a week and a half. Asking someone who has no interest in science fiction whatsoever to read a science fiction novel, 
might not even be possible. Like, people might just might not. sit down, like, halfway through. And that's why you're all silly geese for writing books. <laughs> <laughs> yep, silly geese.